Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and a happy Friday. Uh, for the, the sort of benefit of those who've not been on these webinars so far, uh, my name is Alexander Leach. I am the Senior Education Manager for the Middle East and for ACCA, and I will be taking this evening's session on the Practice to Pass webinar series for Strategic Business Leader. This is, um, that's, that's actually sadly our last session of five. Um, and I just want to check, as usual, any technical issues. Um, hopefully, you can all hear me. I'll just have a quick look in the question panel to see if, uh, if I've got a bit of, um, got, got anybody who's got any issues in there. So, uh, some usual suspects. Hello, Yolanda. Hello, Sonika. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm glad that everything's well with you. Um, fantastic. Hello, Nasia. I actually do not know when the recording will be available. I assume that's something uh, the technical colleague who is online will be able to help you with. Uh, hello, Furkan. Thank you very much. Lovely to see you've made it on a Friday evening. Hi, Sharice. Uh, Paul, appreciated to see some familiar, I say faces, but uh, we'll go with familiar faces and names. So, Aisha, lovely to see you as well. Um, so, yeah, hopefully the fact that we've got some regulars means that you guys have found it um, useful and you keep coming back, which is always a positive sign. This evening, will we, well, we will be going through the remainder of the uh, case study called Highlights. So if I just move into the presentation, um, for those who were on last night, you will have got a good taste and a good understanding of what this case study is about. It is a, a budget a hotel, a no frills hotel chain with a few challenges. One of them that we looked at in detail last night was the potential acquisition. Um, and now we're going to be looking at things like disruptive technology, social and environmental impacts, integrated reporting, and we're going to be doing some work in requirements two and three. Um, we've already done evenings one, two, three, and four. So with no further ado, let's get the ball rolling and get stuck into the exam itself. So as I've already said, um, it's located in, well, I didn't say this, but it's located in Deland. Uh, it's a budget hotel chain and it's, um, it's really, really successful. And we did a question where we looked at its uh, national competitive advantage because of several factors, one of them including infrastructure, uh, the government support, high levels of customer service, and so we're trying now to sort of progress with our understanding through the remainder of requirements. Requirement two, um, following a subsequent decision by Highlights Board, the proposed acquisition of Comfy Stay Hotel chain has recently been announced to the deal and stock market. So it looks like they're going ahead with it, which is very promising. So maybe they did take into all the considerations that you guys gave in your answers. So I think that, that we did um, an evaluation of the potential strategy uh, many of you did a, a really good job of that. In fact, not many, all of you did a really good job of that. So it looks like the board paid attention to us. However, it's not all plain sailing. Um, there's been some negative press in the Deal and Daily News about the proposed acquisition, which has criticised Highlight. The chief exec, our friend Bernie, um, is very concerned about these reports and has asked the business analysts team, so you work within the business analysis team, to consider Highlight's response. Requirement A. Prepare a draft press release. Now, many students sometimes get a little bit um, bamboozled, that's a word, uh, bamboozled by what a press release is. And they go, oh, sir, I know what a report is, I know what a briefing note is, um, I know what a letter is, but I'm not sure what a press release is. Well, you'd actually be pleasantly surprised or pleasant to hear that it's probably one of the most simplest professional communicative tools that you can be asked to produce in the exam. So being asked to prepare draft slides, uh, draft slides, where'd that come from? Uh, draft, draft a press release, should I say? It's because slides are on the next question. To prepare a draft press release is probably just as easy as being asked to produce some slides. Um, so you are preparing this press release in the response to the criticisms assessing the social and environmental impact of Highlight's proposed investment in Vlandia. Now, one thing I will straight off tell you is that you will be using these to structure your answer. So the, the requirement already gives you a little bit of an idea. So you'll be looking for social issues 
and you'll be looking for environmental issues stated in the case about potentially investing in Vlandia. Many of you are probably already thinking, well, hang on a minute. There are many social issues because there's a, you know, there's proof that the company we are looking to acquire uses child labor and they maybe don't have the highest standards of pay. And then many of you might also be aware that there is environmental issues. So from your understanding of the exhibits you've already read, you may be aware that this particular country of Vlandia doesn't have a very good um, sustainability, we'll call it sustainability record in terms of pollution um, and, and CO2 emissions. So with the view of reassuring the stakeholders highlights intentions to maintain its high principles and standards in its acquisition of Comfy Stay Hotel chain. You get professional skills for demonstrating a communication with clarity, conveying the relevant information to highlight stakeholders. So exhibit four is the one that you've been drawn your attention to in the scenario and the requirement. And also you can draw down on your reading previously from exhibits one and exhibits three. So here we go. Let's move into the next part. I was just having a quick glance there if there was any questions, but so far I can address them at a later point. Uh, the next requirement, although highlights or next part of this requirement, although highlights shareholders are generally responding favorably to the proposal acquisition of Comfy Stay Hotel Chain, highlights board is concerning considering how it should effectively communicate with all its key stakeholders to ensure that they understand the strategic direction and decisions of the business. The finance director has recently, um, the finance director has recently asked the board to consider the use of integrated reporting in assisting the communication and in building relationships with highlights key stakeholders. You are required by the finance director to produce briefing notes, uh, which she will use in assisting her discussion with highlights board members, which assess the role and benefit of integrated reporting in assisting effective communication and building relationships with highlights key stakeholders. So this one's a little bit sort of a little bit oh, I'll say not as well received as maybe the first requirement. Uh, in terms of requirement one, because it's a little bit more wishy-washy. Uh, we've got social and environmental impacts, and I know many students are a little bit hazy on that. Now, the examiner loves to ask about this sort of thing, because to be quite honest with you, it's very, very, very topical, very much in current affairs, and definitely something that you would need to consider when looking at wider stakeholder involvement. And the same with integrated reporting. Students don't often do very well when looking at integrated reporting, and they tend to just get stuck into talking about some of the things they've learned in a textbook. This is a typical type of requirement where students will waffle on or they may be even just brain dump everything they know about the six sources of capital of integrated reporting. And you might be thinking, oh, well, I know them. Well, actually, they're not necessary because that's not what the requirement's asking. It wants you to assess the role and the benefits of IR in communication and building relationships. So it's going beyond pure textbook knowledge. You evaluate this, so you give an argument which has um, an appropriate level of judgment, and you have all in all 50 minutes for the full two parts of this requirement. In relation to B, you'll be looking at exhibit five. So now we're going to be doing our effective reading and planning. And as I go through, we'll be reading through exhibits four and exhibits five to try and pull out some necessary information to help us answer requirement two. If we take a look at the, uh, the Dealand Daily newspaper, catch the headline, has highlight hit a low? And we just pay attention predominantly to the parts that I've highlighted. So it's the chief executive uh, and the founder, Anders DeWalt, admits in an interview last month that the family has failed to recognise and keep up with the investment demands of modern hotels. Moving further down, however, staff in Comfy Stay Hotels are currently paid well below the rate of pay earned by the equivalent staff in Dealand. Uh, they have also worked longer hours per week with fewer employment rights, such as holiday and sick pay. 
Most of Comfy Stay's staff are women who are offered few opportunities for training and development. In addition, Comfy Stay's policy of only employing men as hotel managers and senior management in the hotel would seem to be a stark contrast to the strong focus on equality within the highlights employment practices. So immediately I'm finding things within this news report that I would be saying in relation to particularly the social aspects of Highlight and how they are contrasting, how they are different to that of Comfy Stay. Comfy Stay was fined recently by the government of Vlandia uh, for polluting the waterway in a main coastal tourist town with an outflow of untreated effluent. So there's an environmental issue. Highlight will have to invest significant amounts of money to make the hotel chain a viable and sustainable part of the business if it wishes to adhere to its high expectations from environmental sustainability. Vilandia has a thriving tourist economy, uh, which has in fact, since the global economic recession, um, we'll start that again, which has in fact grown since the global economic recession. Interesting. National recycling levels are 50% less than other countries uh, and the reporting of CO2 emissions is much worse in this region. Closing points for the, ex um, for the actual exhibit. They say that they exploit low wage economies, uh, poor education population, exploit locals and tourists alike. And it could be a questionable move for highlight, uh, an unethical direction of development of highlight to follow. It's quite um, quite a negative press release, quite a negative article, and no wonder the board are concerned about this. If we take a look at Exhibit 5, we actually get to um, read through some of the comments of the board, and I've um, importantly stated who these people are in terms of their role. So we've got Bernie, who we already are aware of, who's the chief executive. We've got Jay Brown, which is the sales and marketing director, Thomas Myers, who's the operations director, and Elizabeth Fox, who's the finance director. So as we read through, uh, this is the board reflecting on the article in the Dealand newspaper. The sales and marketing manager, uh, I think we need to consider how we communicate with such major strategic direction. The ops director, Tom, uh, has gone in to say our shareholders are only interested in the bottom line. That's quite a strong opinion and maybe not that well enlightened. Uh, immediately, I get the impression that Tom has a quite a sort of pristine capitalist type point of view when it comes to his ethical and sustainable outlook on business. Um, so long as comfy stay hotels make a profit, they won't care about much anything else. Yes, it's very much like a pristine capitalist. Our hotel customers likewise, so he's now talking about the customers, really only interested in their own personal experience. And do our hotel staff really care about more than how much they get paid and when the next day and when the next yeah, when their next day off is? Oh, it's very cynical. Bernie then comes back with, I disagree with Tom. We must consider all our stakeholders and how they should we communicate our activities to them. And then we move back into Jay stating, I believe it could be a strategic advantage uh, whereby we should seriously consider our social and environmental activities. So this person here, Jay, to my opinion, is more of an has an enlightened self-interest when it comes to communicating with stakeholders. He believes that potentially giving more information will produce a better level of quality of information and better quality informed stakeholders make better decisions as a result of that, for example, with the investors in mind. The second half of the extract or the exhibit, we go back to Tom, uh, strategic advantage, how? I just don't see what information would be interested, uh, would interest our stakeholders, other than that we are profitable and our prices are the most competitive in the market. Wow, well, very strong opinion. We are a budget hotel, our strategic advantage is based on our price, not on communicating useless information to our stakeholders. It's a very narrow view there by Tom. Then Elizabeth, the finance director, makes a very, very good point. Actually, Thomas, uh, we have a wide range of stakeholders who are interested in a wide range of aspects of our business. Effective communication with them is critical and important to us and them. Our own opinion is that introducing integrated reporting would offer us the best solution in communicating and building relationships with our stakeholders. The operations director, but surely 
The press statement that we are going to release in response to the acquisitions in Deal and Daily News is satisfactory to all our stakeholders, isn't it? The chief exec says not all our stakeholders will see the press release. Tom then goes, then why bother? And then Bernie, the chief executive, positively closes by saying that, Elizabeth, could we ask one of your business analysis team to provide us with some information on the importance of communication with our stakeholders and the role of integrated reporting and how it can assist in communicating? So, requirement 2A, I would like you guys to take your time, so that's 13 marks all in all. So that's going to be just a little over 20 minutes if you are going to produce an answer for this particular part of the requirement. Readdress the requirement itself, prepare a draft press release. So you are going to get marks for communication and the actual easiest way of producing a press release, quite frankly, is writing the word press release at the top of your exam script, underlining it and then giving a, a, a heading. So it highlights proposed acquisition of Comfister Hotel chain in Vlandia might be what you wish to call this press release. And then within the press release, I would split it or necessarily use the structure of social and environmental concerns raised in the said um, article in the newspaper. So I would use the newspaper to help you structure an answer. And therefore, I will give you, let's have a look at the time allocation now. I will give you till 20 past to come up with a few ideas of what you would be writing in your press release. And then we'll go through and debrief it. So I'll give you just less than five minutes on this one to do a nice plan. So just a couple more minutes now doing a bit of an answer plan. Uh, make sure you're pulling out some social and environmental issues that are raised in the actual press release, uh, sorry, in the actual newspaper article and how you would respond to them in your press release.
So I can see, thank you, Aisha. Uh, you're already getting engaged with this. Superb. Um, I'm hoping for a few more things in the question panel, so pop your uh, ideas in there as well. Um, basically, just think about what environmental and what social issues are raised and how would you go about actually you know, tackling them, trying to ease the concerns uh, through a press release of those stakeholders. So the sort of things that you'd want to pop in your press release um, include a discussion around or a discussion, a, a, a written element around the employee rights. So you could have a subheading within your press release um, saying employee rights. This would be a social issue. Highlight must ensure staff in Vlandia are not exploited. And therefore, your statement, the way in which you write your press release, would we want to as if it was going to be spoken. Um, and given to maybe posted on, on in a newspaper or um, an industry press release. So therefore, it wants to be written in a way that is very positive in relation to your organisation highlight. We will offer no, no availability of child labour or excessive working hours, and we will consider the wage rates of Vlandia to give parity with our, um, you know, our existing staff in highlight hotels. Where's the effect of this? Uh, we've also got a section there around employee opportunities, particularly when they talked about only males having senior managerial roles and females, where so it was definitely an issue in Vlandia in terms of the gender, gender pay gap, gender um, equality. So we need to talk about our investment of $10 million in training and staff development, diversity and equality policies. From an environmental point of view, we could talk about any environmental investments Highlight currently um, already does, uh, which we know is a very um, sustainable organisation. And therefore, we could talk about an investment in environmental systems, which we could imprint into the Vlandia hotel chain, which we acquire as Comfy Stay. We would increase recycling, look at reducing their carbon dioxide emissions, and also look at their wastage targets to get them well above the uh, the area norm, the geographical norm. One of the last points you probably want to make is in regards to a long term approach. So you could talk about this from an ethical or an environmental standpoint, stating that the government of Vlandia and the travel and tourism industry, uh, we would work with them to improve environmental awareness. There was an array of uh, additional things that could have gone into any of your answers. So if we have a little look now at the uh, marking scheme, you've got up to two marks for each relevant point in relation to the assessment of social and environmental impacts of the proposed investment in Vlandia and considering how this reassures stakeholders of highlight. There was a lot going on here, a maximum of 10 marks available. So you'd want to write around five things. And here we have, well, again, I don't need to count them, but what, what we got? over 20, I would say there, all of which would score you two marks each if you expanded them correctly. And the way you would expand would be to peck, point, expand, comment. I see a few things now popping in the uh, in the question box as well. Um, so thank you, Dina. Wonderful stuff. Yeah, I like that. Do you mind if I just read that one out? So you've noted that you would need to be apologetic, empathetic, and give assurances to the current stakeholders and shareholders um, that the current pay conditions will be improved amongst the staff of Comfy Stay. Well done, that's really good insight. Thank you very much. So if we move forward into how we'd get those professional communication marks, and I believe three were available, um, 
you wouldn't get any marks if you didn't present it in an appropriate format, which I will continue to just ring home and make an emphasis on. So it wants to be in a press statement format, which actually is a very easy format to do. So if we just flip back, press release at the top, highlights proposal, acquisition and comfy stay hotel chain in Vlandia, and then the way in which you write it needs to be as if it would be addressed as a press release. So in a positive way, empathetic, very much just like what we were saying two seconds ago. Good communication states that they are or very well communication in the bottom right hand corner is that the press release is clear and communicates to the most relevant points very effectively. If we look at how we would go around doing this in the far right, so the press release will be well set out and includes key headings such as employee rights and employee investment. It will be written in a way that reassures a wide range of stakeholders including employees, shareholders, and the public and customers. It will also address environmental concerns of key stakeholders. So, so far, so good. Um, if there's anything else before I move on, let's have a quick look. So we've got a few other bits in here. Uh, Aisha, we need to be specific to the scenario always. So no matter what, you always have to apply the case study. So now if we take a little stroll into requirement B, and this is now particularly related to integrated reporting and how it would help being uh, giving more communication and building relationships. We're looking here for an evaluatory skill. Um, the finance director has asked you to produce or to provide her with briefing notes. So hopefully briefing notes is a format that you are now very familiar with. So very short to the to the point for the attention of the finance director. Um, and that will be a discussion in the board meeting. So if you think about what you're producing, it's something that the finance director will have in front of her, um, probably the moment she walks into the board meeting or a minute or so beforehand. So it needs to be very quick and easy to read. Key points first and definitely emphasizing on, on the urgency of communicating effectively and building relationships with stakeholders and entwining the scenario heavily. Um, so how long will I give you this? I'll give you a couple of minutes. So I'll probably give you until half past to, um, to draft up a bit of an answer plan for your briefing notes uh, for the attention of the finance director in relation to the, the integrated reporting and it be needing to give effective communication and build relationships with key stakeholders. Hopefully you're engaging with this requirement quite well. I do recall earlier in the uh, webinar series, one of the students asking about integrated reporting, asking if we could do a question on it. So your wish is my command. Uh, hopefully you are live on this evening so you're able to get something out of this as well.
Thank you, Nasir. Yes, so you're talking there around integrated reporting, helping with um, strategy and communicating with stakeholders about the strategy, also having a long-term orientation versus short-term intentions. So uh, that's very insightful. You've also stated that IR helps build relationships with stakeholders by addressing them effectively. That's an interesting outlook. Thank you very much. I'd love to hear how or see how you mean or what you mean by addressing them effectively. So if you were to write your full answer, not that you need to do that for me, but just food for thought from yourselves. Um, what do you mean by effectively? What, what actually is good, effective communication with shareholders, stakeholders alike? Just another couple of minutes on that one. Um, you want to try and steer away from here is overemphasizing any academic knowledge in terms of maybe the types of capitals that are talked about in integrated reporting. You want to spend more time applying the actual need to be better in terms of communicating and building relationships and using integrated reporting knowledge that you have to try and sort of strengthen that very case specific. Sounds the plan there, Yolanda? Yeah, for the attention of the finance director an assessment of the role and benefit of internal uh, internal reporting, uh, integrated reporting. Nice terminology there, Yolanda. Um, internal, I need to get that right, don't I? Integrated reporting provides holistic uh, views on all of the fundamental capitals providing transparent communication to all key stakeholders. It creates values in short, medium and long term. Wonderful. Thank you, Nasir. Continue to expand as well. And Yolanda is adding even more. So wonderful there. Um, I would actually talk a little bit to start with about integrated reporting because the finance director obviously is going to be addressing the board. So uh, integrated reporting, a concise communication of an organizational strategy, governance and performance. It demonstrates the links between the financial performance and the wider social, environmental and economical context. It shows how organisations create value over the short, medium and long term. The role of integrated reporting in communicating and building relationships. So it can communicate broader and more relevant information to assist decision making. The information would go beyond pure financial data. Stakeholders use information in many ways, so they manage investment risk and evaluate the hotel industry dynamics, assess regulatory and environmental, assess the term uh, proposed and stability. Investors largely are interested in quantitative KPIs, but other indicators are other indicators important in decision making process. So environmental, social and governance issues are something that investors are also interested in. And that's quite contradictory to what the operation director Thomas was saying. Integrated reporting offers insight into the business strategy, performance, governance and prospects, encouraging improvements in relationships with stakeholders. Some of the benefits to highlight include improving relationships, greater insights, a longer term outlook. Investors benefit from information which informs decision making and have a greater understanding of how value is created. 
from a marking scheme point of view, you would receive up to two marks for each relevant point made in relation to assessing the role and benefit of integrated reporting in assisting effective communication building relationships. And they've split the points to between role of integrated reporting in, rela in relation to building uh, relationships and communication and the benefits of integrated reporting to highlight. A maximum of 12 marks was available, so you're probably looking for around six things out of this considerable amount that you'd have to go at here. Hopefully you take encouragement from looking at the marking scheme. I think that very much looking at the marking scheme allows you to actually see what the markers see and gives you a little bit of insight as to maybe how much you need to write along with the mark allocation. Yes, Nasir, always you need to link things back to the case, so make sure that your answer, when you are producing uh, your answer there, you are talking about highlight, you are talking about the discussions in the exhibits that the board of directors were making, and maybe particularly how Thomas was a little bit incorrect in his many of his assertions. If we move forward, so uh, we continue with question two, and we have a look at the... Um, the marking scheme for the professional marks. So we get up to, I believe this one actually had quite a lot. So we had, uh, yeah, three marks for evaluation. So you would get really good evaluative marks uh, for an answer that is well-developed, objective, and takes into account most or all of the potential implications of the decision to implement integrated reporting. How would that look? Um, well, if we were to take it here, examples of consideration would be the improved relationships with shareholders by giving them information to manage their investments and better understand the value of the business for its customers and a better relationship with its staff through more open and long term approach to them to consider the future of their employability and employment prospects. Now, what's really good is that this was a previous exam. So this was an exam sat back in 2018 in December. So we've got the examiner's report. Now, many of you, we had a read through the first sections of this last night, but I'm just going to highlight and pull out the key bits specifically in relation to this question whilst we've done a walkthrough and while it's fresh in your head. So the format required us to produce a press release, and this would have been something that we needed to take quite a lot of interest in doing. Um, we move down to the yellow highlighted section where I'm stating that most answers were well structured with both social and environmental factors covered separately. The information was pulled from exhibits one and exhibits three and stronger candidates did such. There was also a need to read exhibits four, so the count, they needed to counter the criticisms in exhibits four. In green, weaker candidates, weaker answers were poorly structured or failed to address a sufficient range of relevant actions by highlight to encounter the potential concerns raised in the newspaper article. Candidates who scored highly in professional skill marks did so by, by presenting their press release in an appropriate turn, which would communicate a strong, convincing message to most of its key stakeholders. Candidates who scored low in professional marks did so because they wrote an essay. So again, just to sort of reaffirm, um, you may have done essay formats when, when at university. It's no longer appropriate, particularly given you were asked to produce a press release and you would not expect anybody to read an essay out as a press release. Requirement B, uh, 2B, the requirement was driven by the board discussion relating to the importance of key stakeholder information and its key decisions and strategies, uh, strategies <laughs> highlighted in Exhibit 5. Strong candidates also recognised in its role in adding value to a wide range of stakeholders and also identified highlights key stakeholders who would be interested in such information. Moving down into the blue, good answers also discussed a range of potential benefits for highlight stakeholders, such as better information for investor decision making and information from staff in relation to highlights investment and development. In green, however, it was disappointing to see how many candidates did not demonstrate sound understanding of integrated reporting beyond the ability to describe the six capitals. Weak candidates were little further, went little further than a basic definition of integrated reporting and the six capitals, which did not address the requirements. 
latter part in question 2B, candidates who merely describe the general benefits and features of integrated reporting or who gave examples of six capitals with no application. So they're the necessity again to use highlight in your case, uh, in your answer. And they failed to give a satisfactory demonstration of the professional judgment related to the board members and therefore scored low professional marks. So this draws me to the end of requirement 2A and 2B. Now, I would be interested to know if you have any questions in relation to that requirement. And I'd also like some feedback on that requirement as to whether you'd like it as much as you liked requirement 1, because there was a lot of positivity last night about how much you loved uh, requirement one, because you got to talk about national competitive advantages and you got to do an evaluation of a potential acquisition. So I'd be interested to see if this requirement was as favourable as last night. What I've done now is, um, for the benefit of some students who don't often look at integrated reporting and probably weren't aware that there was such a thing as integrated reporting because it might not be an area that they've necessarily engaged with in wholeheartedly, is um, I actually found a publication that gives a really good understanding of the six types of capital. Um, and also, I'm not going to read through everything, but I just want to pay attention now to this lovely grey box. So, um, thank you, Farhan, for your feedback, by the way. I appreciate that. So, requirement A is easy, but requirement B is not such as good or not so good. I think they, because it's less, it's less accounting and more sort of business management, business leadership, maybe that's why you find the first one a bit easier compared to the second one. Maybe you have your own reasons as well. So here we have the International uh, Integrated Reporting Framework, which defines the six types of capital. Now, although you didn't need to know them to answer the question just set, it's probably a nice little segue to talk about them no matter what. So natural capital, this includes resources such as water, fossil fuels, social, uh, social solar energy, crops, carbon stinks, uh, which cannot be replaced and are essential to the functionality or functioning of the economy as a whole. So natural capital considers necessarily the environment. Human capital, so we'd report on our skills and how we actually staff the organization in addition to their commitment and motivation, which will affect their ability to fulfill their roles. So human capital could to some extent be similar as well to that of social and relationship capital. So here we have this encompasses the relationships and attendant resources between an organization and all its stakeholders, including communities, government, suppliers and customers. Because many people will state that this is something that we should really be reporting to our stakeholders so they can make an informed decision on the relationships our organization has. Financial capital is the traditional yardstick of performance. This capital includes funding obtained through financing or general by means of productivity. So this is debt and equity. Intellectual capital is often referred to as an intangible associated with brand and reputation. Um, and in relation to things like patents, copyrights, organizational systems and related procedures. And then the last form of capital, we've got manufactured capital. This encompasses physical infrastructure or technology pertaining to this, such as equipment and tools. So they are, um, they are sort of six capitals that you need to have an awareness of in relation to integrated reporting. Moving now back into the requirements, back into my PowerPoint, we're now going to take a look at requirement three. 
So requirement three overall is 33 marks. You would take 59 minutes to do this, and it's split between A and B. Now, you will need to read exhibit six in order to fulfill the, in order to do the requirement, and you will do so as we go along. So the most, or the most recent board meeting of Highlight discusses the occurrence of the potential threats of disruptive technologies in the hotel industry. Following this meeting, the chief executive has requested further information for the board um, on this issue. Required here, the chief business analyst has asked you to write a report. What does a report format look like again? Uh, if you could throw that in the question box, that would be useful just to make sure it's sinking in. So report format, and thank you for those who have written in the uh, in the question box already, would be to, from, date, subject, introduction, short subsections with subheadings, and then a closing statement slash conclusion. Write a report for the board meeting, uh, which discusses the potential challenges to highlight posed by the development of disruptive technology which are emerging in the hotel industry. So the first part of the report wants to talk about the challenges, and I absolutely love this requirement. I think it's probably one of the best to see because actually it's really straightforward. So the first part, you need to have a general understanding of disruptive technology. So all you need to do there is understand that disruptive technology is something that causes change within an industry. And therefore, you might be thinking about things like the apps that you have heard about in this scenario. So talk about the disruptive technologies and the challenges, but then flip it on its head. You need to highlight the potential application of disruptive technologies, which may be considered by highlight. So that's a good requirement. You're looking for the issues and then you're also looking for how you can apply them to the business model. You get four marks for demonstrating skepticism by probing and challenging the opinions of the board. Fantastic. The second part of this requirement, the board meeting, the finance director presented information on the three risks in Highlight's current information system environment. And the board has requested further analysis of these risks. All right, so that's quite interesting. The finance director has asked you to prepare three presentation slides. How many? Three. One of each for the risks identified. And what's lovely about that is in your exhibit six, you are given the three risks and therefore you are given the three titles for your slides. And yet many students in this exam seem to ignore this and make up their own risks. So pay attention when you are given your exhibits and you are given an appendix within an exhibit because it gives you a lot of direction there. And accompanying notes, so make sure you write notes as well. Um, for the board's next meeting, assessing the potential outcomes of each risk. So for each risk, you want to talk about the outcome. And then for each risk, you also then want to talk about the recommendation. So you could have two sections within each slide uh, talking about outcome, potential outcome of each risk, and then another section within that slide talking about recommendation. And then underneath, you would give more detail to the slides and what you have put on the slides, and therefore you would peck your way through. Recommendation actions for each risk, which highlights should take in order to control these risks. It's a lovely question. If you really boil down section 3B, all it's asking for is use the risks given, tell me what the problem is and therefore the outcome, and then try and tell me how you would mitigate these risks practically. You are given three marks for demonstrating commercial acumen by showing insight and understanding of the information and risks and controls, the information system risks and controls. So while I've got you, let's have a little read through Exhibit 6. These are the board meeting minutes from November 2008. We have the chairman, the chief exec, the finance director, the operations director, and the sales and marketing director. 
Opening statement, the chairman opened the meeting, stating that the meeting had been scheduled to discuss the challenges faced by Highlight in managing and developing its information system. He noted that the president that the personally found the rapid development in information technology difficult to keep pace with, but was confident that Highlight would develop an appropriate response to these t developments. Agenda item one, disruptive technology. The first agenda item was introduced by Jay Brown, the sales and marketing director. Miss Brown expressed her concern for the hotel concept being under threat and that there had never uh, been more alternatives for customers to staying in a traditional hotel. In particular, she explained the emergence of rent a room, which is this case's version of Airbnb. She had emailed a handout below to the board in advance to understand the new threat. So an explanation of rent -a room rent -a room is a totally online marketplace which offers flexible hospitality options, enabling guests to quickly and conveniently book short-term lodgings with third-party hosts. These include apartments, apartments, rentals, hotels, um, hotel rooms, hostels, and homestays. rent -a room receives a percentage fee so that's how they generate their revenue, both the guest and the host, um, for every bookings made. There is over 2 million accommodation listings in 60,000 towns and cities across the world. Wow. Massive, massive um, reach there. Notably, it does not earn any of the lodgings in its ad that it advertises. So it has no capital expenditure in relation to the marketplace there. Um, many of the hosts lived in a renter room often sell often give high speed Wi-Fi facilities, um, plus extras such as web movies, and the prices changed or charged often far lower than the hotel room prices. So that's a cause for concern, and she'd like to bring it to their attention. Tom Myers, on the other hand, this lovely operations director with a very narrow point of view, uh, believed that rent -a room concept is a limited threat to highlights established business model. No, it's not. Uh, his opinion was that, if that it's just people sleeping on the floor of friends' houses and raiding their fridge in the morning. It's quite an interesting concept for anybody who has stayed in a, a rent -a room type establishment. Definitely not that. It's hardly what we offer. Customers want far more than that. He also expressed his belief that this would be a short-lived phenomenon. The threat from rent -a room is clearly more, than an, uh, more of an if than a when. I think we should not overreach and just and let this blow over. Mrs. Elizabeth Fox, the uh, finance director, com commented that the technology was likely to keep disrupting the organization so be a disruptive influence on the hotel industry in the future. She explained that modern travelers and particularly the millennials, so those who are approximately 20 to 40 years of age, are looking for value for money, flexibility, and the ability to manage their whole stay from a booking through a flexible checkout uh, via their smartphones. She also noted that smartphone apps are now being developed to enable smartphones to use alternatives for key uh, rather than a key to door entry systems of hotel rooms so there's some more disruptive technology there so quite a lot going on here we've got an opinion that in my opinion is is actually incorrect um, from the operations director we've got an enlightened individual in mrs fox whereby they believe that technology will continue to disrupt identifying the market of the modern traveler and the millennials talking about their wants and needs so value for money flexibility being able to manage their stay so personalization all from their smartphone as well as a specific bit of disruptive technology like the implementation of phone entry systems to hotel rooms other technological developments in the hotel industry were discussed, including the emergence of an online travel agency, so they're calling these OTAs, and the hotel comparison and booking websites, which I'm hopefully, um, which you are hopefully aware of. Um, they've called this the personalization technology, such as smartphone apps, which provide guests with personalized service, such as customized local offers. Wow, that's a pretty good service. Um, which will probably give them local restaurant deals and cheap tickets to local attractions. 
Mrs Elizabeth Fox concluded that the in, concluded the discussion with the statement that hotels could no longer no longer simply rent a room. We need to give a traveller more of a reason to stay with us directly. So book with us and stay directly. The Chief Exec Bernie summarised by stating that he could not ignore disruptive technologies and that before any decision is to be made on how to react to this, Highlight must assess the extent of this strategic threat before identifying a relevant response. Now, this is where you guys come in on that one. Taking a second, uh, and just bear with me a second there, just so I can get a little bit of a water. Taking a second now to have a look at the uh, the next part, so the information systems uh, and the risks of their control. So the finance director opened a discussion on information systems and risks and controls with a statement that although Highlight had invested significant amounts of money in its website in the last few years, it had not developed a clear information system strategy. Also, she expressed her concern that control management, control and management of these risks to its IT and information systems environment has not been adequately addressed. The chairman commented that Highlight had not experienced any breaches of its information systems and that therefore we must be doing something right. However, the finance director presented the board, uh, presented the board when she considered three key strategic risks and information system risks considered in appendix one. The finance director then recommended that the risks should be prioritised, that Highlight must have an appropriate action to control these risks. So the finance director presented Appendix 1. Actions to be considered before the next board meeting. So the first one, identify the challenges posed by disruptive technology and recommend the application of disruptive technology by Highlight. That in itself is Requirement 3A. Now the other two relate to Requirement 3 three B and they actually do give you a little bit of help. So the first one, number two, identifies appropriate actions to control highlights information systems. But then number three outright tells you um, one of the recommendations you should be making, which is to investigate the possibility of recruiting an IT director. Appendix one, this is what your slide structure should look like, but we won't just jump into that immediately. So we've got lack of focus on IT and risk strategy. So the cause of the risk, weak focus on IT and information system strategy, and a weak strategic leadership of our IT and IS development. Limited support for IT and information system strategy at board level. Well, out right there, you would probably need to recruit somebody at board level to give that support. Cyber and data security breaches, failure to update our information systems in line with latest cyber security threats, lack and appropriate internal physical and access control. Business continuity threats an interesting one, and this is the ability of an organization to actually continue to trade if there is uh, continue to trade and operate if there is a disaster. So there is insufficient planning for business continuity a lack of awareness at board level of the importance of critical information systems. Just imagine a hotel, if you were to maybe turn up and their IT system was down, which has happened probably to presumably many of you, it's happened to me as well, and they, guess, and they say, sorry sir, uh, we can't find your booking because our computers aren't working. Or likewise, if you're already staying there and then your uh, access to your room is, is revoked because of a breach in IT systems. So there's lots of practical issues here to consider and very relevant ones. So here we have the requirement again. Let's just re, re familiarize ourselves with requirement three. You need to write a report. We know that report structure. You've all got that now. That report will have potential challenges interfaced with disruptive technology, but also potential applications to highlight. You guys now will want to spend some time doing a nice answer plan. Um, for this requirement. So I would expect you to do your answer plan in a report format um, and do a nice little introduction with sections focusing around disruptive technology. So maybe tell me what it is and then tell me how, how, how and why it is a challenge to highlight and then how we are going to apply it to highlight. It is now eight o'clock 
and I will give you five minutes to do that. So at five past eight, I'll re-engage, have a look in the chat panel, and hopefully there'll be quite a few things in there. So thank you very much. Have a go doing an answer plan for requirement 3A, please. Yes, Diana, it, it, it's, it does sound very much like it is Airbnb. So thank you. I've just seen your uh, your comment there. Wonderful. Thank you, Yolanda. Uh, thank you, Yolanda. Thank you, Sonika, for some good insights there as well. Uh, Yolanda's talking about disruptive technology and what it is. So it is one which disrupts the existing business model or shakes up an industry with groundbreaking products or services to create an entirely new industry. Rent a room is a substitute, Sonika states, uh, of traditional hotels with flexible hospitality and home-like hotel. Uh, which can manipulate, or which yeah, which can manipulate the taste of people.
So just another couple of minutes, guys. Stick with it. Um, yeah, so you're doing an answer plan. And effectively, if you boil down this question, what you're really being asked is, tell me a little bit about disruptive technology. Uh, highlight what the disruptive technologies are in the case and why they're going to cause a challenge for highlight. There was no pun intended there either. Um, and then also tell me how highlight could use some of these disruptive technologies. I'm going to give you a little bit longer here, so I'll give you at least another two minutes on this one. It's quite a good one. A few more things pop into the question box, which is um, very much encouraging. So thank you, Yolanda. Thank you. I want to say, uh, Diana, hopefully that's how you correctly say your name. Uh, apologies if it's not Diana. Um, yes, so there's a potential loss of revenue as a result of them going elsewhere because of a cheaper option uh, for going quality rather than paying for a budget hotel like Highlight. Yolanda linking it back to profitability. I like how you're doing your PEC. Well done. Right then, ladies and gents, let's have a little wander through uh, my answer plan. So we would start with the report format, which hopefully you are now all very familiar with. Wouldn't we all love a report in your exam? It would be a really in, in, engaging way, encouraging way to maximize some of the structure that you need to have in this professional exam. So a report to the board of highlight from a senior business analyst. Put the date of your exam in there, so the 3rd of December 2019. Give yourself a title for your report, the impact of disruptive technology on highlight. Your introduction, the following report will evaluate the potential strategic impact of highlight of the disruptive technologies. And you could then talk in detail about emerging disruptive technologies which reshape the industry, offer a more personal, individual, unique service and experience matching customers' budgets and spending patterns. If we choose to ignore the development, it could pose a threat to Highlight's competitive future. You could then go into detail around the challenges in relation to disruptive technology. So here I would talk about rent -a room being a real threat to Highlight, and that Thomas Myers, his operations director, their assertions that the threat, bear in mind you are being skeptical, so this is an example of skepticism, you're questioning the board of directors, so you're questioning the operations director. His assertion that the threat is an if rather than a when is incorrect and is likely to be dangerous to highlight its long-term existence. Moving forward, a uh, little discussion here around flexibility. So rent a room offer a wide range of services such as individually tailored breakfast requirements, local on-site knowledge to offer up the minute office, offer up to the minute recommendations um, for highlights of the city, or providing introductions to local contacts which can get customers the best up-to-date offers. 
Rent-a-room hosts are likely to have lower overheads than Highlight. The implication on Highlight's competitive advantage is a budget hotel. Um, so as they are, are probably are renting a room out of their, their current abode, uh, or renting a room of an abode that they already own, they probably aren't having the same level of overheads maybe from a, a I'm just trying to think now, a hotel overhead. So we're going to have lighting and heating, but also we're going to have the, the sort of inflation of that in having staff, towels, um, probably washing facilities, uh, amenities and things like that. So you're probably going to have a lower overhead base for rent a room, which individually can be very flexible for them. But necessarily, they don't have the same scalability that highlights business model does. From a personalization agenda point of view, rent a room hosts have one customer at a time versus highlight where they have over 46,000 hotel rooms across 510 hotels. Logistically, this is more expensive and more difficult to manage. Disruptive technology in relation to smartphone technology, and I saw a few people in the question panel talking about um, apps, and there's a nice little graphic here illustrating an app. Uh, the use of smartphone applications in a, in a range of ways for customization through to door entry technology is a major development in the industry and one which Highlight must consider. Um, they would need to consider the apps in terms of new software development, so they might need to look at whether they have the expertise, which potentially they do not. They would also need to look at it in terms of a risk and cost benefit analysis if they are going to allow it for the new door entry technology. So you also want to be a little bit skeptical in terms of how quickly you want to adopt these systems. The application of disruptive technology by Highlight, so it offers an opportunity to enhance the guest's experience um, and it'll probably lead to higher customer satisfaction as a result. They will be able to look at such things like local weather reports, local events and ticket offerings and also restaurants, theatres and other visitor attractions, booking facilities through third party channels close to the hotel. In conclusion, because I have wrote up a report, uh, disruptive technology presents significant challenges to our business. As stated, we can no longer simply offer hotel rooms to our guests. We need to become more relevant focal point for the destination's experience and tailor our offering to more individual customers' needs. This will be a significant challenge to us, but one which we cannot simply ignore. Can have a look in the question panel. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you, John. Good to see you on tonight. Um, outstanding. So I'll have a read of that in a moment, John. What I'm going to do now is just move to the next slide and just give you an overview of the marking scheme. So we get two marks for each relevant point relating to the challenges of disruptive technology which emerge in the hotel industry. They've used a structure to split them. Oh, I'll tell you what, I'll get rid of that because it doesn't really help to look at. We'll go back to the spotlight. So disruptive technology, a little bit of an explanation of it. The challenge is posed, so you get up to two marks for each relevant recommendation to the potential application of disruptive technology to highlight. Um, and you get a maximum overall of 14 marks. And hopefully you can take quite a nice bit of courage from this marking scheme to see there is a significant amount there to have a go at. I'm just going to leave it there for a moment for you to have a little read down before I flick forward because I don't want anybody missing an opportunity to see that there is a lot going on there. If we have a look at the marking grid for the professional skills of professional skepticism, uh, and if you would you know, pay attention now to what you wouldn't get any marks for, uh, they failed to question the opinions of the board. So that helps immediately. How do I get my professional marks for skepticism? I must question the board. And that would be questioning the board from um, the operations director perspective very significantly. Moving over to the very well, which is where you will all be aiming and definitely be scoring. Um, they would present their, um, their argument, their, their report, 
in a suitable, well-argued, evidence-based argument to support the challenges of their opinions. So a lot of case application needed. What does this look like from an example's point of view? Uh, they wrote their answer in a courteous manner. So they didn't produce an argument which was negative towards the board members. Um, they did not state the operations director is wrong, but rather that his view should be challenged and reconsidered. So very diplomatic, uh, maybe more diplomatic than myself. Uh, moving on, they also answered clearly commits to the challenges and indeed explanations, the challenge, explaining the challenges to the operations director's opinion with reference to the evidence presented by the finance director and from the industry report. So where does this lead us quite nicely to now? This does lead us to requirement B, but I'm going to just take a step now, uh, given the time. So it's quarter past eight. I believe this is a good point for a natural pause. So I will um, pause my screen. Uh, I'll also write on the screen when to come back. So I'm going to give you 15 minutes. Uh, come back at half past eight, and then we will continue with our walkthrough. And I will also get time in that 15 minutes to review anything I've not had a look at in the question panel. And you will also get a chance, if you want to, to have a little refreshment break, make yourself a cup of tea, and ask me any of the questions in the question panel that you may be thought of. So thank you. I'll be back in 15 minutes. And uh, for the benefit of everyone, just so it's on your screen, you can see when we'll be back in action.
Right, folks, yeah, we'll kick back off at half past. And if you've got anything you need to ask me, I'm just having a little review of the question panel now. So if there's anything you need, give me a shout. Thank you.
So just a couple more minutes, and uh, I can see a few things in the question panel. So thank you, John, for these. Um, I'll address them once everyone's back on board. Cheers. Right then, ladies and gents, so we're back in the room. Hopefully you had a time to, um, you know, refresh, have a little break, stretch your legs if you needed to. And um, we are going to now just sort of make a bit of a walk through the, uh, the remainder of this requirement. So requirement 3A, just to sort of get us back in the frame of mind of what we were doing. We wrote a report, we drafted a report um, to discuss the potential challenges of disruptive technology. And then we also applied it to the case and moved into how we would at highlight try and embrace this disruptive technology, all the while being skeptical of the board and their assertions, particularly that of the operations director. So we could have talked about the emergency of disruptive technology, the challenges, flexibility and personalization, smartphone technology, applying this to highlight. And we gave a lovely conclusion. In doing that, we then realized that there was a considerable amount of available marks. So you got two marks per well-developed point. So remember, it's always important to peck so make your point, expand your point by explaining what you mean in the context of the case, and then give your comment in terms of how that actually relates to the question and the so what effect of expanding your answer. Professional marks for scepticism, as always, structure, turn and language were extremely important in getting all of the professional marks available. Moving into requirement 3B then, so at the board meeting, the finance director presented three strategic risks in relation to the information system environment. And you now have been asked by the finance director to prepare three presentation slides, one for each risk. And accompanying notes for the board meeting to assess the potential outcomes for each of the information system risks identified by the finance director and then make recommendations for each risk. So, oh, hang on a minute. There he is. Do apologize. I believe I might have clicked on the wrong button. Uh, so there's a few people stating that they've screens frozen. Uh, so we will just take a hop, skip and a jump and we'll kick back off now into this um, in, into our requirement too. So hopefully everyone can see it. Cheers, guys. Sorry about that. I'll blame myself. And uh, thank you very much for bringing it to my attention. 
So where were we? Yes, I would like you, if you would be so kind, um, as to do a walkthrough now of, um, well, we think we've already done the board mini meetings. Yes, we have. So in relation to this exhibit, I want you to tell me from Appendix 1, Exhibit 6, what the three risks were, and these are going to be the actual structure for your answer plan. So to make sure that you're engaging, have a look at Exhibit 6, Appendix 1, and let me know the three risks that you've seen there. Yep, John straight in there. Lack of focus on IT and IS strategy, cyber and data security breach and business continuity threat. Yolanda's nailed it as well. It looks like you guys are very much on the ball this evening, which is, uh, which is very good for, uh, for me as well. So using this structure, which we will look at and be more than familiar with, uh, here they are, lack of IT strategy, uh, lack of IT and information system strategy, cyber and data security breach, and business continuity. These are our three stars that will header up our answer plan. So you will need to produce three slides. Risk one, lack of focus on IT strategy. Risk two, cyber security, uh, cyber and data security breaches. And risk three, business continuity threats. I would like all of you now to spend some time producing an answer plan for the requirement 3B. So it is on my calculations, um, 25 to nine. I'm gonna give you at least five minutes now to draft up three slides with accompanying notes. And the, uh, the idea is to give practical recommendations for each of these risks. So um, lovely, lovely risk-based requirement. Students tend to do really well in these. Uh, and then we'll have a walk through how we'll go about my answer plan, um, the marking scheme, the professional marks for commercial acumen, and then we'll talk through three as an overall requirement in terms of the, um, the actual examiner's report. Thank you, Yolanda, Atika, Husnain, and John. Recommended action, Aisha, will be given in a sentence. sentence. So in your notes, your notes do not want to be bullet points. Just for the purposes of an answer plan, we bullet point them. But for your actual answer, your notes want to be written as if somebody could present and would be speaking those notes. Um, so on the slide, it can be a bullet point, but underneath your notes are then the expansion, still using your PEC mentality to expand your answer. Thank you for the question, Aisha. Appreciate your input.
see a lot of action in the question box. Um, so Sonika, Hasnin, uh, Nasia, Dianana, um, usual suspects. So thank you very much for your engagement. Give me a moment, I'll have a read through all of these and uh, I'll give you some feedback as we go along. But so far, so good. Nika, wonderful point there. I uh, hope you don't mind me reading this out. So IT technology grows fast and is an integral part of every business. A lack of focus on IT and information systems could limit the growth of the business. Now, in that instance, when you are saying the business, just change it to highlight. Um, so it could limit the growth of highlight. This highlight should appoint an IT director who will be responsible for the IT and information system development. Uh, focus shall be on the given e-business strategy uh, through the IT and information system development. Well done, Sunika. Hussain, wonderful little plan there. Yeah, similar along the lines of Sunika. Lack of focus on an IT and information system strategy could make highlight outdated and the loss of the potential millennial market of customers. Diana, thank you very much. Loss of competitive advantage due to IT and information strategy leading to customers being more inclined towards booking rooms through online apps rather than the conven conventional way of booking a budget hotel, which I am now uh, through hotels. Husnain, thank you very much. Let's talk about data security breaches then. Data security breaches could lead to bad reputational impacts as highlights are, uh, oh, well, we're using the term fiduciary duty, why not? Have a fiduciary duty to protect the key data of customers and did not pass it on, do, and to not pass it on to other organizations without the customer's consent. So a nice little bit, bit of uh, understanding there of GDPR and data security, so well done. Diana, uh, recommend, recommendation for a lack of IT and information system would be to recommend for them, uh, the board of directors, to invest in a good online sales ordering system which allows customers to book rooms at their own convenience. I love the idea, the concept practical, throw that in your answer plan, but when you do write in your answer plan, try to be a little bit more expansive than the word good. What do you mean by good? So that would be the question I'd give you there. No need to answer it now, but thank you very much. Yolanda, good notes there, and Sonika as always. Let me have a little read. So keep them coming because most people have got up to risk two. So I'm going to give you even more time now. I'm going to give you another five minutes to ensure that you continue to engage with this. So let's now focus on risks two, uh, cybersecurity uh, breaches, and risks three. The one that most students actually struggled with, which was a lack of business continuity. So the business continuity threats. I'd love to get your insight on that. So please. Please write a little bit in the question panel about business continuity to, uh, to give me a chance to have a read of it as well. So Yolanda, just having a read of your points regarding note one with reference to IT focus, You're talking about hiring an IT manager. Uh, I, get, I believe that's a fair fair recommendation, but given that the, um, the exhibits allude to an IT director, why not go one step further? Sonika understands that a cyber security data breach can lead to a damage of reputation along with a loss of intellectual property like confidential information. Um, so thank you very much, Sonika. That's a good insight there. Some practical recommendations, installation of a firewall security, data encryption to prevent breach. Yeah, now, come on, guys, let's focus a little bit on uh, risk three. So we need to understand uh, the outcome. So what would happen if we had poor uh, business continuity planning? And what would happen in terms of if we're going to give recommendations? So we need to implement some form of business continuity, uh, maybe implement a disaster recovery plan. That would be a good way of trying to uh, 
deal with any business continuity issues. There's organizations out there in the world now, ACCA, we have business continuity plans. Uh, my previous employment, we also have them as well. You may have them in your organizations and you may be very familiar with them. So thank you. Let's share our experiences. Thank you. That's a wonderful question and I'm going to paraphrase it. So uh, she's asking, how many marks would you get effectively per slide? Well, there are 12 marks in totality and there are three slides required. So you're looking for four marks per slide with accompanying notes and you get up to two marks for each relevant point made in assessing the potential outcome of each of the information system risks identified by the risk or by the finance director. So you'd probably want to be looking at a couple of points on each bullet, sorry, a couple of bullet points on each slide, but then the expansion is where you get your two marks fully allocated there. You also get two marks for each justification, uh, which is recommended in action, how highlights should take in order to control these risks. So four marks per effectively slide plus notes so i'd be looking for around two things on the slide uh, with the accompanying notes expanding upon them hopefully that's answered your question aisha no you're more than welcome thank you uh, Yolanda, lovely notes for notes three. We continue to see Highlight as a going, con as a going concern organization, which is a positive thing. Uh, our vision is to implement successful planning for our staff to embed a culture driven with a workforce who is innovative to sustain the longevity of our organization. So while I've got your attention and while the screen is uh, not frozen, which is good, uh, we'll have a look at what I actually put on each stage. So we did three slides with accompanying notes, and I'll talk you through each one of these now. Risk one, lack of focus on IT and information systems. The outcomes highlights business strategy is not supported by its current IT and information system strategy, which could lead to a business failure. The business opportunities are missed due to poor IT and information strategy, and there is a waste of resources due to a strategic leadership and direction. Their recommendation would be to employ an IT director and align their business strategy with its information systems and IT strategy. Note, integrated business strategy uh, with the creation of an IT strategy, growth through innovation, employ an IT director who can lead the information system development needs. That's a key one there, the third point down. Our information system strategy is supported and enhances the overall business's strategy. So if you have better data management, information system management, and if you have 
better IT strategy in terms of the IT focus, given we are looking to be a completely innovative organization and keep up with disruptive technology. So we've got a really good website. We get lots of bookings through it. So we have lots of data. It's extremely important that we have the usage of that data. We should consider how our IT capabilities and activities can enhance or potentially inhibit our strategic direction. With risk number two, cyber and data security breach is a very practical problem when it comes to anybody's data. Um, outcome, loss of key organizational or customer data, several business interruptions, severe business interruptions leading to a loss of business and damage to our reputation, which everybody seemed to have a good understanding of, and financial costs due to compensation and legal claims. The recommended action, invest in the latest cybersecurity systems and controls, which I believe was alluded to when we talked about investing in maybe um, some firewalls or some, um, so some controls there. Implement and upgrade information systems, physical and access control environment. Notes, the virus hacking security breaches are a significant threat to all modern businesses. Internal physical access and control weaknesses within an organization, for example, if you do not need an access card to enter a, um, a, a computer room, you could probably plug in a, a USB and extract information that you should not be privy to. So physical controls are a big thing as well. The consequence of, uh, of a severe interruption, particularly of an online booking facility, would be loss of business and dissatisfied customers. I believe that probably every single person on this conference call, on this, on this Go webinar platform this evening, has probably dealt with an IT system that's been faulty in their time and how frustrating it can be as a result of that sort of lack of ability to do what you want, which in this instance is booking. The latest industry standard firewall and virus protection software will be needed and we should access our systems internally. We should give authorization and staff training as a result. The one that students were slightly more um, we'll call vague on is the word I'll use there. Um, and as I go through this, a business continuity threat. The outcome of the problem with a business continuity would be that we are unable to operate effectively due to no disaster recovery plan, a loss of business or damage to our reputation and a cease to operations. The recommended action would be to implement a disaster recovery plan, strategic level focus on the role of IT in the overall business activities. With sufficient planning and risk assessment, it is likely that Highlight will not uh, be ready for a business critical event uh, with insufficient planning, sorry, they will not be ready for a business critical event. So this is what we mean in relation to business continuity, being hit by something that could actually stop us from trading. This may result in the business being unable to operate for a period of time, which will lose the business uh, in terms of reputation and income and could potentially lead to an overall business cease of operations. We should implement a disaster recovery plan, including terrorist attacks, cyber attacks, fire flood, or any other potential critical business system threat. At ACCA, we have a business continuity plan, and it's been something that we've been involved in recently, and I believe that many of your organizations will too as a result of this being quite a topical conversation. So how does this look in terms of a marking scheme? And as I've alluded to earlier when we're talking, um, you get up to two marks for each relevant point made in assessing the potential outcome for each of the information system risks identified by the finance director. So that's at the top here. Uh, I'll just get my pointer. And then just underneath, you get up to two marks for each recommended justification of the action in which highlights should take in order to control these risks. So risk one, risk two, risk three. You get up to four marks per slide uh, presented. So you get up to four marks. That would be your 12 mark maximum. And as you can see, per the marking scheme, there is considerably more marks available, more points to be made than marks. And therefore, it is significantly important to ensure that you stick to your 1.8 minutes per mark of actual writing time. So, if we take a look now, 
at the uh, at the professional marks. Interestingly, this time you get marks for commercial acumen. Normally, when it slides, it can be communication marks. But here we go. Commercial acumen to get his demonstrating insight and understanding of the information system risks and controls. You get nothing if you in demonstrate poor judgment of the outcomes of the information system risks identified identified in the finance directory. In other words, you get nothing if you do not understand those three risks that were given to you in the exhibit and appendix one. However, you get a considerable amount of commercial acumen professional marks if you show evidence of a well-developed and strong commercial judgment of the potential outcomes. And I'm going to like the next slide even more so. For risk one, the candidates has clearly recognised the commercial impact of a sound information system strategy upon the successful achievement of Highlight's overall business strategy and the potential for the business opportunity to be missed as a consequence. They've given recommendations and justified sound commercial solutions to the potential risk. Uh, moving forward, the answer focuses directly and correctly on how this strategy, strategic risk could affect the long-term survival of the business. Overall application of how these three strategic risks can impact the commercial viability of Highlight and how they should address it clearly um, would give you significant amounts, three marks of commercial acumen, professional marks. So naturally now we're going to have a look at the last section of the examiner's report, so a section in relation to requirement three, and uh, we'll spend some time having a walk through this now. 3A, the question required candidates to discuss the challenges to highlight of disruptive technologies. Highlight is the board meet are highlighted in the board meeting um, whereby the minutes uh, were minuted in exhibit six. Candidates were also asked to consider how Highlight could apply disruptive technology in its own business. Professional skills marks were available for skepticism. In probing and challenging the opinions of the board members, in particular, the operation director and the finance director in relation to the level of the threat posed by disruptive technology discussed. The format was a report, which is to, from, date, subject, introduction, subheading sections, and a lovely conclusion. 3A, the question was probably uh, where candidates perform the worst. That's negative feedback, in my opinion, or significantly negative feedback. Many candidates did not demonstrate a sound knowledge of disruptive technology, and many merely repeated the information related to rent a room directly from the case. Disruptive technologies, description of disruptive technologies were generally vague, and only better candidates provided meaningful and relevant explanations of how this may be proved challenging for highlights. Those candidates who achieved high technical marks did so by recognising the direct threat of rent a room to highlight, which many of you did, and I'm very interested to sort of see that you've got a good understanding there. I think that this case, uh, this case was very interesting, and the fact that you, many of you have a good understanding of Airbnb gave you an advantage there. Candidates did not attain a high technical mark where those who failed to demonstrate sound syllabus knowledge, um, who merely repeated case material. These answers were often wrongly focusing on the benefits of setting up a website rather than a listing on one of the price comparison websites, or as well as discussing the OTAs, which is the travel agents and big data. Online travel agent and big data, OTA. It was evident that many candidates did not have sufficient syllabus knowledge or understanding of disruptive technology to make a successful attempt at this question. Many candidates achieved no or low professional marks on this question, as most failed to demonstrate any scepticism. There were several comments about the board members referenced in Exhibit 6, which could be challenging the candidate's answer to demonstrate scepticism, but few candidates did so. This was largely down to poor exam technique, as candidates clearly failed to read the professional skills requirement in conjunction with the technical skills requirement. Had they done this in the case, they would have noted the need to consider scepticism and the question the opinions of the board members as part of their report. 
3B. The question required candidates to advise the board on the outcomes of three risks identified by the FD in Exhibit 6 and give recommendations to these potential risks. Candidates were asked to present their answers in a slide format with accompanying notes for professional marks for commercial acumen, which you are all more than well aware of. The question was generally not well answered. Uh, firstly, there was some evidence that suggests that some candidates had not left themselves sufficient time to answer this question adequately. Many answers were either presented as slides or notes only, which is definitely not something you should be doing. Uh, we've done enough practice on this now. If you're asked to do slides and notes, do them both. And I'm sure you'll now have a good understanding of time management. But make sure you could do some time management practice between now and your exam. So I would advocate many of you having a go at some exam technique by doing a four hour exam. Sit there, see if you can get through it. Make sure you stick to the planning and we'll talk a little bit more about that at the end of the evening. The main weakness of many answers was that candidates failed to meet the requirement of the question by not presenting outcomes and recommendations of the three risks identified by the FD in Exhibit 6. It was very disappointing to see that a significant proportion of candidates did not provide slides covering the three areas required. And I've highlighted in blue, which was clearly specified. They were given to you in Appendix 1. And that's why earlier I asked you to tell me what they were. Uh, moving on, the, folk, the outcomes were particularly weak in many areas where candidates merely repeated the same outcome, such as the business will lose its competitive advantage. So it was saying that that was too vague. For each of the three risks, uh, you would need to give a different um, outcome. So for all three, there would need to be some form of different specific outcome. For the first risks, many candidates correctly recognised the need for the appointment of an IT director as a suitable recommendation to overcome the lack of strategic focus on IT and information systems. Some candidates prove, uh, provided a good range of outcomes and recommendations for the second risks identified. However, the third risk was not well addressed by many candidates, as there was evidence to suggest that most did not understand the business continuity actually referred to. Many candidates talked about the risk committees and appointment of non-executive directors, which was not a consideration appropriate or the most relevant solution for these risks. Wrapping this up, candidates who failed to address the requirement of the question could not score well in the professional skills as they had not provided the discussion of risks, outcomes and recommendations which their commercial acumen would be judged. Even where recommendations were made, in most, uh, many circumstances, they were too generic and not clearly related to highlight risks, meaning that candidates did not earn high marks. Lastly, candidates were, who scored high professional marks clearly showed a good commercial understanding of the impact of risks identified in the most appropriate solution for highlight. So this leads me now to the end of highlight, and we have actually finished the, um, the highlight case study for the time being. I'm just going to have a quick look because there was a few things I wanted to address in the question panel that I saw a moment ago. But likewise, if there is any questions practical in particular relation to highlight or anything else, please ask away. Uh, Aisha's asked a good question there. So you've asked about the um, whether there's a minimum of three questions, uh, um, three requirements within the SPL exam. So the answer is it can be varied. So we saw in Railco there was five. In this exam there was three. And the rule is very much that the requirements um, will vary in length and vary in number. So I can't tell you what the bare minimum will be. Uh, John, thank you for your question, and Nasir. Uh, cheers, Aisha. Yeah, Ebby, I'm going to go over Peck as well, so don't worry, we're not done yet. Um, so I'll address some of the other questions as well. So any areas to focus on Husnain's asking uh, that are likely to come up? Husnain, nope, I have literally no idea. Uh, what I will say is that you cannot question spot, unfortunately. 
uh, it just does not work anymore in the uh, in the nature of these exams. So the answer is study hard, study broad, and take advantage of all the resources we have. Um, before I get stuck into the individual question, I think I'm going to give you a chance now, uh, if I am correct, to have a bit of fun. Uh, we've not done one this evening yet, so I did prepare one. And it's all around the highlight case study. So hopefully you can remember how we've done these Kahoot's before. If you've not been on Kahoot before, um, you would need to go on to Kahoot. Dot it, K -A -H -O -O -T dot it on your search engine. Your mobile phone is a, is a fair device to do it on, but you can do it on a tablet or a laptop or a computer, and it will ask you for a game pin. I will produce the game pin very shortly when I change my screen to set up the game. You will then, when you are in the game, uh, after you've given your nickname and the game has started, have several questions that pop up onto the screen and you will have to answer those questions on your mobile device. Uh, so with no further ado, I'll get this set up. Bear with me a second. Uh, so I've just paused the screen and I'll get the Kahoot ready to go. And we'll have a bit of fun on our final evening of the Practice to Pass SBL webinar session. So the game pin, oh, that's slightly louder than I wanted it to be. The game pin is 6821.95, and you've got to enter your name after you've popped the game pin in. Uh, hopefully, Yolanda's in, DSDD, wonderful. Nasir, don't worry, I'll give you time to get on board. So on a Friday evening, we've got a considerable amount of people logged on. So I'd expect a good turnout for this. Um, interesting. <laughs> we've got a nickname of 6821.95. Happy days. Uh, hello, Sandy Springsteen. Wonderful to see you again. Hello, Michelle. Hello, Tyder. Hello, Tiga. We've got a couple of familiar faces as well. Yolanda, Sharice. Uh, hello, Nasir. You're in. Happy days. So what we'll do is I'll give you just another couple of minutes, maximum. We only need really one, don't we? Um, so we'll go with one more minute. And once that minute has reached, we can get the game underway. Right. Be careful, guys, because if you leave it unactive, it sometimes drops out. So if you if you check your mobile device, make sure the numbers are still there. Uh, so everybody just check their tablet or mobile phone. Make sure you're still logged in on there. I don't want to miss anybody out. It's our last Kahoot. So this is, you know, big, big prizes here. And here we go. Evening five. Only eight questions in this evening's Kahoot. Uh, quiz question number one: What was the headline in Dylan's Daily News? Beautiful, yeah. So 21 of you got it correct. Has highlight hit a low? And that was in relation to the article in the newspaper whereby they were discussing the social and environmental concerns of acquiring the um, Comfy Stay Hotel. And from that, we were able to form the basis for our answer in requirement two. So we talked about the issues in relation to their employability practices. We talked about their environmental concerns in terms of pollution, the uh, inequality of the people within Comfy Stay from a gender perspective. And there was a lot that we got from that lovely article. So newspaper articles, the exhibits they create are very, very effective. To go, oh, hello, Furkan, top of the table to start with. Uh, DS in second, Jamie, Yolanda and Sonika, well done. What is the family name of the current owners of Comfy Stay? The Disney family, the Adams family, the DeWalt family, or for some reason I've misspelled, the Kahoot family. <coughs> Do apologise for the last one. Slip of the slip of the finger. Oh, 
Oh, here we go. It was in the Walt family. Uh, I love how some of you went for the Kahoot family. I, I appreciate that. It's just a general guess. Nobody went for the Disney family, and three of you went for the Adams family. Um, let's move on. Furkan, Yolanda, Sandy Springs, DS and Jamie. I think it's on the same top, so give or take, same top five. Well done. Uh, what was the net present value in the key investment data of Comfy State? Well done, yes. 10.6 million was a positive NPV for Comfy Stay. If you can recall back to last night's session, we talked about it being around 13.2% sort of, of the initial investment, which was a considerable return. With a positive NPV, we'd talk about the, um, the shareholder wealth maximization, but we'd also need to consider the actual reliability of a net present value, so the discount factors used, the assumptions in terms of cash inflows, revenues, costs, and cash outflows. And we'd also need to really question if we could do some sensitivity analysis whereby we make some changes to our NPV calculations. And then look at if there's a change from positive to negative as a result. Furkan is sitting top, and Yolanda, well done. DS in third, Jamie in fourth, and Faran, you're doing very well on a correct fire streak. Uh, apparently, you're on fire as well as a few of us. True or false, Jay Brown is the sales and marketing director. Yep, Jay Brown is the name of the sales and marketing director. 22 of you got it correct. You'd have been able to draw that down from the exhibit. So again, oh, hello, Michelle. Up five places, you are the highest climber. Uh, looks like the top five are remaining consistent. You guys are quite unshakable. Elizabeth Fox is the finance director. False or true? Well, I'll tell you what, many of you are paying some significantly good attention to this case study. It is true. Dasu is on a streak, five in a row. She needs to be a little bit quicker to get in the top five. Furkan, I don't think you've been rumbled off that top spot yet. You must love the Kahoot. DS, Yolanda, Jamie and Farhan. Is my screen frozen or is this the same top five consistently? What is the name of the organization, organization or threatening um, the concept of the traditional hotel industry. Is it Airbnb, home to go, Vaste, or rent a room? Beautiful, absolutely beautiful. 26 of you got that one right. Rent a room. I believe the person who went for the blue one, home to go, is probably a slip of the finger. Uh, well, we're doing really well here. Sandy Springs, well done. Welcome to the top five. Where have you been all my life? No, it's really good to see you up there. Uh, congratulations. Two more questions to go. How many accommodation listings does rent a room have around the world?
Oh, interesting. It is two million, uh, unfortunately. Not many of you got that. So I think uh, maybe that was something that didn't resonate with you as much. Needn't worry, though. Uh, it's given a shake-up for the top five. So Yolanda now sitting pretty at the top. <coughs> Excuse me. Sandy Springs, well done in second. Dasu has got a nice little flame next to them. Furkan slipped from first to fourth. You can see how fickle this is. And then we've got DS there. Right. Last question for the quiz. Which of the following is not an information and IT risk highlighted in identified by highlight? Beautiful. Yeah, well done. So there were three that you should have remembered because it was the last question we did. Slide one had a heading that said lack of focus on IT and information system strategy. Slide two had cyber and data security breach. And slide three had business continuity threats. The one that was not on there was internet search engine cookies, which I just randomly put in there for entertainment yolanda eight out of eight you should be very proud sandy springs very well done there second and dasu in a respectable third position the top five was made up by ds and the fifth position was jamie so well done only eight questions this evening a nice short quiz we didn't need to drag it out too much so that leads us now nicely to sort of the back end of our presentation and a bit of a summary of what we've done over the last four or five evenings. And it gives you a chance to ask me any questions as we go along as well. And in that sort of um, sentiment, give me a moment just to flick back onto the PowerPoint and have a look at the question panel because there was a few things I wanted to address. Um, so bear with me a second while we've got this here. John, um, so your question is extremely um, specific, and I'm going to sort of lean away from it. So John, for, for everyone's benefit, John's asking about specific models. So for example, like the, the BCG and the Poppet, which isn't a problem, but um, it could take me you know, forever to talk about them. Um, so what I would like you to do is actually have a look at how they come up maybe with a, an approved learning provider. Uh, so have a look online. There's a lot of lot of free resources there for those specific models. So uh, it's something I'm not going to be able to do, unfortunately, John. I do apologise. Uh, Abby, I think I've already answered this one. We will be looking at your exam technique of PEC very shortly. Unusne, um, no, sorry, I can't do any question spotting. So a bit of a summary of highlight. Then we looked at question one which looked at national competitive advantage and a strategic evaluation. And for that, we could have and did use uh, a Porter's Diamond, but it's not to say that we have to use a Porter's Diamond. If you remember looking back at the marking key or the marking scheme, it explicitly stated you were not marked down for not using any of the aforementioned models. The strategic evaluation was a really nice one where we looked at whether or not we should purchase comfy stay and how that currently fitted in with our our um, business model of highlight being a budget hotel and maybe some of the challenges that we would face as a result of buying a country buying in a country five thousand miles away and then this evening we've gone through social and environmental as well as an ethical assessment to some degree so we looked at the social environmental issues raised in the um in the exhibit of the newspaper report we also looked at integrated reporting and how it improves communication and the benefits that will give our stakeholders in requirement three, requirement two even. And then just not a moment ago, we looked at question three and we looked at disruptive technology and risk management. So that was highlight. Uh, this one only had three requirements in, so it does vary depending on the actual case study itself.
if now we just take a second and see what we're coming up with for the next part, um, what I would like to do is just sort of move back in. So we did, I don't think there is any, I'm just checking the question box, nothing else popped up in there. Um, so we've done a considerable amount over these four years. I'm just going to skip through now. So what I want to do is just spend a bit of time recapping um, the, um, the examiner's reports and anything that we need from those. So just one second. Um, yeah, everything's going well. So this will probably wrap us up quite nicely as well. So it's just a nice recap. So remember, weaker candidates per the examiner's report and per the insights from the examining team, uh, do not integrate the case study or use exhibits. Uh, you must apply the case to the exhibits. And I think many of you have got a good understanding of this now. In fact, I know you do. So that's really reassuring. Um, weaker candidates brain dump and superfluously waffle. Rote learning is not appropriate. I haven't seen a single requirement that's needed you to know everything from a textbook. Um, so that's a good one and definitely not needed to write everything from a textbook. We candidates show signs of poor time management, running out of time and not planning. Here's a question for you. How long should you be spending per mark on writing? Yeah, well done, everybody. 1.8 minutes per mark, which is really encouraging to see that you've remembered that one. And what are you guys going to try and do to minimize your lack of stamina? Here's a question. Uh, has anybody got a plan? Because we talked about planning at the first tier to do any mocks. So um, I would expect you to be now doing some mocks over the next few weeks. Yeah, Aisha, you should be doing some mocks. You should be doing some uh, question practice. I can show you where to find them. In fact, I will show you where to find them come towards the end. In fact, why not just do it right now, Alex? So here we go. Um, in fact, now pause that for a second and we'll complete the slides. Then I'll show you. So the next one is... Uh, do not develop uh, their points. And then we've done a lot about so what, and we're going to do a bit more. So when I've talked about PEC, and I know we're going to get into it, I mean, put your point down. Use a subheading approach, expand your point, and then comment on it. Poor format and structure and presentation, would you be happy to give your answer to the boss? And that's something that I often emphasize all my students to do. If they give me an answer that's absolutely torrid, um, I wouldn't pay for it, and therefore, why would I expect a strategic business leader to be able to produce it? I wouldn't. Uh, last couple of weekly areas or weak areas. Answer the question they had wished had been set. This is a very common mistake. Uh, we've seen it throughout the examiner's reports. We've seen it in the, the uh, December 2018 exam. People trying to just give an answer which they know everything about integrated reporting. Uh, that wouldn't have been appropriate. People trying to just answer a question that actually they wanted as opposed to the one that was required. And that's why it's important to go back and readdress the requirement as you are going along and just writing out your answer. Focus on technical frameworks or models or twisting of frameworks as scenario. So many students will get really hung up on models. They'll love the models are like, oh, yeah, I know everything about, you know, Pestel, Porter's Diamond, Ansoff's Matrix and all those wonderful strategy and corporate governance models. I know everything about COSO framework. But the reality is, is that it's all well and good knowing them. But unless they're appropriate, you shouldn't apply them. It's better to use a more logical, pragmatic approach, maybe like pros and cons, advantages and disadvantages with a conclusion and therefore use more of a logical approach to answering a question than try to fit in a framework. Many students might repeat the same point or copy out the scenario, and therefore repetition does not score you any more marks. And on top of that, well, just in a point to note, many students often find themselves rewriting the question at the top of the exam script, so where their answer booklet is, don't do that, you're wasting your time. 
Uh, write an inappropriate turn. This is a professional exam. You must write as such. We saw this evening where you are addressing the board, but you're also being skeptical of them. You need to be professional in your language, so you can't tell them they are necessarily wrong immediately. Uh, and it was the advice of the examiner was to, to write it in a challenging way, whereby the operations director needed to maybe reassess their opinion. Some students lack in depth or knowledge of the syllabus. So prior knowledge is assumed, and I've given the example here of applied skills level, and particularly in relation to financial management. Some showed not a lot of evidence of using the ACCA study re resources, and I showed you that last night. You should follow the link, go on there, because there is an abundance of free resources like the examiner's reports, like study tips and techniques, videos, 10 things I learned about the September 2018 sitting is particularly useful. And if we have time, I'll do a little walkthrough of that as well. So that's all well and good. What are negative things? Well, here's the good things if I have a look now. Um, so strong answers. Use the case study and the exhibits. So they would refer to highlight. They would refer to the finance director, the chief executive officer, and the individuals named in the case. It really strengthens your answer. Um, maybe for the real core example, you would use John Rose and you would use the names of the finance directors, the chief execs, and so forth. Were precise, succinct, and to the point, answers were in appropriate and specific sort of structure. And therefore, if you are asked to produce a report, produce a report. If you're asked to produce a briefing note, do as such and so on and so forth. Strong answers manage their time effectively and therefore answered all the requirements. And we have seen consistently that it's more often than not the last question that students struggle with. In fact, it is definitely the last question that students leave because they lack the stamina to continue doing the full four hour exam. And this links nicely, shows prior exam practice, sure then they've done prior exam practice. If they are a good candidate, they've got strong answers, you can tell they've already done a four hour exam, two time in exam conditions. Students will develop their points and get up to two marks per available points. Give a good structure format and presentation using subheadings, prioritization and understanding the audience. Strong answers, answer the specific requirement and read it as such. So they'll answer what's being set, not what they wish had been set, and therefore carefully read the question. They will apply frameworks and models where appropriate and only if appropriate, using the case to direct their answer. They will move on after each well-developed point, ensuring no repetition to maximize marks, write in an appropriate professional tone as if someone had paid for their answer and drew on their breadth of syllabus knowledge and recap their applied skills level, for example, financial management. And now at this point, I'll just pause for one second because I saw a question very relevant to this in the question panel a moment ago. Sharice asked, I got nine exemptions. Will I be at a disadvantage? In all honesty, um, you will need to considerably recap some of the, the papers you have done at university. So the way the exemption framework works is that your university degree will be accredited um, with the ACCA. So your university degree will be at a standard which allows you to get nine exemptions. But it doesn't mean that you can forget everything from your degree. So as such, it is highly advised that you recap some, maybe financial management being the key one, some of your previous studies that you've done with the university. And you could also have a look at the ACCA syllabus to try and support that. Now, the last point, good candidates, strong candidates will have shown evidence for using ACCA study support resources. So, how to develop a point. Now, before I go back into this, I will just take another review of the question panel because there was a few other things I wanted to address. So 
So thank you, John, for your feedback. We are about to just recap the PEC or the PEC model, uh, the PEC method, should I say. So thank you. I'm glad that you'll find it useful um, for most requirements. Uh, John, uh, maybe I'll need to take this one offline, but I'll just answer it quickly. Will you be available? No, I will not be available for marking any of your mocks. Um, Aisha's asking specific questions around P1 topics. Um, this is a completely new exam. Although there is syllabus integration, so overlap between what the previous P1 and P3 um, previous exams, there is a lot of new content as well. So if I were you, I would consider um, not just recapping them in P1, P3 mentality. I would be looking at this exam in a completely new format. Um, I've just had a question regarding any new articles. Uh, let's have a look after we finish this presentation. We'll have a look and see if there's anything new on the examiner's study support website. Before we do that, let's just recap how to PEC. So the so what approach is something I coin. It's how I try and get students to develop their point. And because you get up to two marks per well-developed point, it is important that you continue to expand. The first thing you should do is get your point down on paper. So with an underline heading and then your point underneath it. So you have a subheading, the point itself. So the, the, what are you trying to say? So this could be an internal control weakness. It could be a key risk within a business. It could even be a strategic direction. It's very um, easy to apply everything from the point perspective. Students do not unfortunately score a lot of marks for quite simply stating a point from a case. They should expand by explaining what they are talking about. So their, their expansion is an explanation of the point above. And their comment is very much the implication or impact as a result of their point expansion and comment. It works a little bit like this. Now, the, the one I gave earlier, the one I gave, I think it was yesterday, was that you find the key issue in the case you explain as to why it is an issue, and then you link the impact back to the scenario. Your point in this instance, and this was actually in relation to Railco, so this would have been evening three, was that 40% of the stations do not have ticket barriers. Your expansion, so to explain it, this has led to more fraud on the networks, so the Railco network, as passengers are not paying for tickets. Your comment, as a result, this will lead to a significant reduction in revenue. How this would look in your exam, passengers without tickets would be your heading. And you would write your PEC in continuous prose. So it has been highlighted that over two years, that for over two years, the rail curve believe that there is a significant number of passengers that are traveling on the rail curve network without tickets. An internal control weakness would appear to be that there is approximately 40% of the rail curve stations that do not operate a ticket barrier, allowing the potential for customers ticket fraud. This potentially will have serious damaging consequences on the performance of rail curve in that revenues are not being optimized. I think this PEC is a really effective way of continuing to expand, and it can be used from many different perspectives. The next one, again, was a real curve specific one, but we could have done this on the highlight on any of the case studies that we will see. The point being made here was that Sealand and ANR had, vested in, had invested in online booking systems. Our expansion was that Railco lacked an investment and or a development in IT. And the comment was that this would hamper the long term performance of the business. Um, a lack of investment in online booking systems, a further internal control weakness could be seen as a lack of internal invest on, an investment in online booking systems. Several of the national train operators offer online booking facilities and evidence suggests that this has positively impacted upon revenue growth and customer satisfaction in all of these businesses. See Appendix 3. A lack of focus upon IT investment and development is a key strategic important system, as a key strategic information system uh, could have been an internal control weakness and could hamper the long term performance of rail curve. So your PEC model 
is something that I would massively stress, um, as would I stress the need to use our ACCA study support resources. I went through this last night, so I won't spend too much time, but just make sure that you're aware that on the ACCA website there is a significant amount of study support resources. Uh, in fact, I will probably have a look on this and show you a few other things, and maybe we'll have a bit of engagement with a couple of other exams quickly. Um, in that the strategic professional resources are here. We've got syllabus guides, we've got the uh, examiner's articles, uh, we've got different specimen papers. So what I'm going to do now is uh, just actually get you guys to make sure you've seen this document as well, which is extremely useful. You can, might remember this from the, the first evening. So how to approach the SBL exam. So they, they talk about time management and they give their, their version of the 1.8 minutes per mark. I often just stick to that as a rule of fast because I think it's the one that's the most effective. Um, they would read and plan. We've done a lot of effective reading and planning. This is important to remember. You should consider your role, the format, the audience, the verb, the mark allocation, any professional skills and any models or frameworks that might be helpful. But that is the last point on there. We would do effective and actively reading the exhibits, looking for any links for the tasks, annotate and highlight our key points. So make sure you take a highlighter. I can't emphasize that enough. And then we also add our notes to our answer plan. When planning, you will, um, you will actually then move into ensuring that you understand the format and reviewing the keywords of the requirements, taking note of any key headings. So if it's a brief note, if it's a report, if it's um, I mean, we've got lots of many things. What have we seen this evening? A press release, if it's a letter. Uh, write up your final answer, and this is a lovely bit of advice. You should do lots of exam technique practice. I wish I had done this sooner, as I was too focused on learning the content when the exam is all about application. So ultimately, we are towards the end of the presentation, but that doesn't mean we're at the, the end of tonight's session. In fact, we are not. Um, just a recap of what we've done over the last five evenings. So we did an overview of the strategic business leader paper, but more so had a little look at the strategic professional level. And one thing I did stress was the need to do your ethics and professional skills module. If you have not done it yet, or you are not intending to do it, make sure you do, because it is significantly advantageous to do your ethics and professional skills module, as this will complement your learning at this level, but also complement you particularly with understanding any ethical scenario requirements, scenario issues, so make sure you get that done. We did some generic study tips and exam techniques. I don't need to re-go over them. Uh, and we've done lots of work now on the examiner's report debrief. Specimen paper two was all about the um, the real co-organization, five requirements ranging in various lengths with different professional skills. Highlight, which we've done over the last two evenings, was three lovely, lovely requirements, but larger requirements in themselves. Uh, still 100 marks in totality, the remaining of 80 marks technical and 20 marks professional. I suppose at this point, it's probably a good point just to take a second to breathe. Um, and naturally ask if there's any questions from you guys. So please, if you have any other questions about anything that you would like me to do uh, in terms of the direction of highlights, give me a shout. Um, other than that, I am now going to sort of move out of my PowerPoint and uh, open up my Internet Explorer, and I'm going to do a little bit of work on how we can have a look at the resources available on our website. So what I've actually got up on screen now is, um, is the 10 things we learned from September's 2018 city. And if you haven't seen this already, I would stress it's a very good and useful sort of SBL um, tech article, SBL sort of support on the website. And I often gave this to students as something to read because it really did help them understand. Um, so what I'm going to do is have a little bit of a walk through this. 
Once I've gone through this, I'll have a look at any articles as well. So um, we can do a few things in the next couple of, well, the next 20 minutes. So the first one, um, knowledge is irrelevant unless it's applied to the requirement. So one thing that we've spent a lot of time emphasizing over the last four or five evenings is that you need to ensure that you refer to the case. The case study is written for the purposes of you to actually apply the case study and hopefully you will be able to get a gist for the case study by doing quite a lot of exam practice and technique. Keep the requirement in mind whilst reading the exhibits. So ensure that you do an active read as you go along. Um, I think that it's something extremely important. We've done it a lot. But again, just because I think we've done it doesn't necessarily mean it's sunk in. Make sure that when you are addressing your exam, you read the requirements. And when you read the requirements, you also read the exhibits and do your answer plan as you go along. Number three, a model may not be the best structure. This is one to note. A model can sometimes be a good way to organize your answer, but following the question requirements or content, the exhibits may be better. Remember the recipient, so remember your audience. Uh, ensure that you are addressing them appropriately. There's been a lot said in the examiner's reports about people giving unprofessional language, maybe giving slang or talking negatively to the recipient. Make sure that you're conscious that if you are addressing it to a chairman or a chief executive officer or a board of directors or effectively somebody senior to you in your position within the case study that you take uh, an address of that. Or if you are actually, and I've seen this in a couple of other exams, whereby you are addressing to a subordinate, make sure that you are not writing in language which is necessarily quite intimidating, or make sure that you are writing in a very straightforward turn and being very sort of open and, and warming towards the recipient if they're a subordinate who needs training, for example. Avoid long paragraphs. I could link the next few together. Head the paragraphs as well. Make sure that all of you take a ruler into this exam, as well as a black pen, but a ruler is just as important. A ruler, a highlighter, a black pen, a calculator, and you are ready to go, because you will need to structure your sentences that are short and punchy, using the point, expand and comment structure, the PEC structure, and then underlining your headings with clear paragraphs following. Say why as well as what. Now, this is kind of already ticked off because, you know, you're going to understand now that you've got to use the PEC structure, which will help you expand your answers. Understand what's different and why it's important. Um, you need to focus on what is significant for the specific decision or situation being covered in the question to support your marks, to get high marks. Making comments that are general won't apply, so make sure that you are specific in your answer. Specific reference, actually, the irony of that is, is here in relation to financial management. Candidates are, uh, could have scored highly in the requirement for September if they'd have had a good knowledge of financial management. Now, we've done quite a bit of financial management when we did real curve and we looked at their performance. Uh, we've also done a lot of financial management in terms of highlight, and we also looked at that potential investment. The reason financial management is such a significant amount of presumed knowledge at this level is because you are effectively at the strategic business level. So you're at a senior level within an organization. And I would turn to anybody within the position of which you will be given in this scenario and state to them, what do you understand in terms of time value for money? Can you understand concepts like net present value and discount factors? Because at that level, you should really be able to understand financial management, such as debt and equity. The last point, skills are not awarded or not rewarded. Skills not rewarded can be valuable. Let's have a little read through this one. Although you must clearly demonstrate the professional skills being rewarded uh, for the questions part, using the professional skills can help you gain marks. They've talked here about skepticism, communication, and ensuring that you make sure that you understand how to get the professional skills. Oh, and a little tip of the hat there to ensure that you do your ethics and professional skills. Uh, so make sure you do your EPSM. Let's have a look if there's any new articles. Uh, I'm not seeing any recently, but if we pop back here, 
um, technical articles. So leadership, um, what have we got here? So we've got some leadership articles, so culture and configuration, uh, ethical decision making, corporate governance, some information here on stakeholders, part one and part two. Corporate governance from the inside out is a very good um, a very good technical article that explains many things like the COSO model, so that would be useful for anybody who wants to scrub up on that. Diversity on the board and the steps forward, um, steps towards better governance. Independence is a concept in corporate governance, and we've got public sector governance, which would have been useful to help us understand, uh, give us a bit of insight for real care particularly. Ooh, the integrated reporting framework that might have been useful to help us if people have read this integrated reporting framework before they did their December 2018 exam they'd have had a better understanding of how it helped with communication and business relationships a little bit on strategic planning and the strategic planning process some more here on COSO in terms of risks and enterprise risk management some differentiation on strategic and operational risks uh, the syllabus area, e-technology and data analytics, getting connected of the, to the Internet of Things. I'll be quite honest with you, this is the first time I've seen this one. This might be a new one. Um, let's have a quick look through this. Uh, I would think that this is probably a good read. Your examiner loves IT, um, and therefore I think this is probably one that if you haven't read, you should definitely have a read through before you finally finish your uh, revision and study it. Applying big data and data analytics in strategic business leader. Again, I would advocate reading this as well because I had a couple of students asking me about big data and then one on e-commerce as well. Uh, organizational control and audit. So there's one on internal audit and the risk and environmental auditing. That's an area in which students often tend to struggle as well. So they struggle with things like environmental auditing. So that could be a good way of scrubbing up your knowledge on environmental auditing prior to your exam. And look, it's only a short article. Probably doesn't take you longer than five or ten minutes to have a read through this one. So definitely give this a little read as well. Innovation, performance, excellence and change management. So there's one on job design. Uh, there's one on performance appraisal. And then there's also one on performance indicators. So if I was going to give you three articles to read in the next... I'm going to say uh, next week, uh, read Getting Connected to the Internet of Things, Applying Big Data and Data Analytics in the SBL exam, and then we've got the last one, which was in relation to risk and environmental auditing. Aisha's asked for 10. Aisha, I've given you three. Um, in all honesty, I don't think 10, I mean, you could read them all, why not? Um, but pick those three definitely and go from there. There are also, and I, I want to have a look now um, at some of the past papers, so bear with me a second. Because this is, this is what you should really be doing now. You should be doing lots of exam practice. So you can find the past exams on here. So we've got past papers for September and December. And then we've got some, some uh, what we call, I'm sure I remember the technical term for these. Um, we've got ones where we, we can't give you the full exam. Uh, we call them sort of sample questions, sample answers for March and June, and we'll be doing sample questions and sample answers for September and December. So one that you will not have seen, which is the September questions, um, a lovely case study on a construction organisation. Um, there are six exhibits, so similarly, you're seeing a pattern here, six exhibits, and the requirements are ranging in terms of we've got one, two, three, four, four requirements on this one. So inconsistency again, you know, it's not just three or five, uh, but they range in marks. So if we have a little flick through, uh, and I'll use my pointer to show you where I'm looking. So A, analyze the financial and non-financial issues which will affect the financial decision on whether to accept a contract to build a road in Betelet or, or B-Tal. Uh, 
So you could use the financial implications, so you look at profitability potential or costs, but then non-financial could include things like stakeholders, customers, employees. Maybe you might want to look at the, the sort of balanced scorecard approach or KPIs. For part B, discuss the difficulties which may be faced fulfilling the criteria stated by Desmond, the Transport Minister Beta. So when I read this, I know full well that I would probably have to have a good quick read of the exhibits and I would be focusing on what Desmond had to say and what the difficulties that Desmond was trying to find and I would use that to structure my eight marks there. Uh, requirement two is not split, so prepare a memo addressing Oliver. Uh, which critically evaluates a nice use of verbs there. So this is a, a negative sort of evaluation, but still a negative is a bit strong, which is a stronger, strong can't use the word strong twice, um, which evaluates from um, a cynical point of view. So you're looking at maybe why Oliver is wrong. Uh, the outline content of the summary of the operational issues in a PID. Woohoo! We all know what a PID should look like now because we did it in Railco, so that would have helped. Imagine if you were a student, you've done the Railco exam, you've done the walkthrough, you've had a go at it, and now you're getting asked about a project initiation document. Well, you know the content of that because you've seen it previously. Uh, requirement three split into three. So A, a confidential memo. Um, so if you're going to produce a confidential memo, you need to write the word confidential at the top of the page, believe it or not, uh, and write it in a way that you would expect confidential memo to be produced, which discusses ethical and reputational concerns raised by the meeting. So no models needed here. Um, just quite frankly, you split your memo into maybe ethical and then reputational concerns. Ten marks, two marks per well-developed point. You'd be looking in the region for around five things here. B, a summary of CC's board review assessing the control weaknesses discussed at the emergency meeting. Wonderful, a wonderful requirement. And then for each control weakness, its consequence and recommendation. 14 marks, I would say you would need to do uh, a control weakness. That would be one, a consequence two, and a recommendation three. I would be looking around four to five control weaknesses here to get you your 14 marks plus your four. 18 marks for evaluation so make sure when you are evaluating you look at the pros and cons and the both sides of a potential uh, issue at hand produce a briefing paper okay advising the board of the advantages established by uh, stated by the risk committee uh, of establishing a risk committee so some knowledge needed here of what a risk committee does um, but risk committees effectively are created out of non-executive directors. Their job is to ensure that there is a risk management process within an organization and ensure that risk appetite uh, is, is actually met in terms of the risk capacity and attitude within the organization itself. The last requirement, prepare two presentation slides. Ooh, how many? Two, together with accompanying notes. So you've also got to do your notes for the chief executive to present to the board, which discusses the benefits and costs. So that'll be your first slide of big data analytics. And your second slide evaluates the possible opportunities to undertake long-term long infrastructure management of the roads in three countries. Second slide. So you've got eight marks for technical, two marks for professional. You'd get those two marks if you genuinely wrote out two slides with notes which were prioritised and accumulated, uh, um, which were communicated effectively. So you're looking for four and four. Um, yeah, so um, Ismail's asked about the, the articles again. Ismail, it was, just for your benefit, risk and environmental auditing. So what I want to emphasize now, without leaning on it too much, is how quickly you can read through and dissect the requirements. What's that? Four requirements. I read them in less than four minutes and I had an idea of what I'd be looking for as I read through the exhibits as a result. So I would stress that you do that by practicing. I've only got good at this through practicing and repetition. And so it's not a not a real issue. It's not a hard sort of 
skill for you to do. Just continue to keep practicing with your exam technique, ensuring that you ensure that I'm ensuring that you ensure, ensuring that you engage with the material. Have a read of those exhibits, um, exhibits. Have a read of those articles, and um, make sure that you stick to the key things you've learned from from the last sort of five evenings. Uh, I appreciate there's five minutes left. So what I'm going to do with that five minutes, I suppose, is it's probably best to just leave it to you guys to let me know if there's anything else I can help you with, whether it's big or small, um, and I would be more than delighted to. If, if there's no questions in these next five minutes, um, that's also fine, but I'm hoping there is a couple just to sort of see if you can get any last gems of wisdom that might help you. Ultimately, thank you all for a fantastic practice to pass session. Uh, I particularly enjoyed the engagement you've given, so I hope you found it useful. We've covered a, a considerable amount, if you think about it. We've considered, you know, three hours every evening, so that's 15 hours in totality, give or take a couple of minutes. And then also, we've covered a, a significant amount of examiner's reports, lots of requirements from various different areas of the syllabus. We've given eyes of the sort of how you prepare your exams, and I think, you know, we've done a wonderful job. Thank you very much for your kind words, guys. I do appreciate it. Yeah, I'm looking for everybody. To, I'm looking forward to everybody uh, passing with flying colours as well. Wonderful. Well, well done. Um, well done to everybody for, for getting this far and for taking the time out of your, well, presumably evenings, but also for everything else you've done. I am very happy that I've been able to help you. And um, I, I wish you all the success as well. So I do, do think that these sessions are very worthwhile. I think you've all done a brilliant job engaging on the question panel. Um, and I look forward to hearing about your success as well. So when you do pass, please get in touch, whether that's on LinkedIn or whether that's via email. And just let me know because it's so fulfilling to hear that you, you've done so well. And I'm sure you all will. Um, all the best. Thank you, Yolanda. Thank you, Cherise. Cheers, Jamie. Thank you, Nasir. Ismail. I'm sure you'll do very well, Yolanda, as will everyone. Thank you, Atika. Cheers, Aisha, as well.
And I believe we're in the last few seconds. So before he cuts us off, uh, just again, thank you, everyone. Wonderful. I uh, am very, very, very uh, grateful of all of your interaction. And I wish you all the best with your future studies with ACCA and particularly your success in SPL. Take care.